Aspect of Occultism by Dion Fortune Narrated by Matthew Schmitz 1. God and the Gods We are accustomed to think of Christianity, Judaism, and Mohammedanism as the three monotheistic faiths and all the rest as polytheistic and pagan. But if we look more closely into things, we shall find that the most polytheistic religions are at heart monotheistic, and that even the avowedly monotheistic have a certain kinship with polytheism in certain of their aspects. Monotheism and polytheism are fundamental twin principles representing the one and the many. A religion which had not got a monotheistic basis has never been conceived by the human mind. Even the most primitive animists have some concept of a father of the gods who made heaven and earth and exercises some sort of rule over the innumerable devils of their devotion. The more highly evolved and philosophical a polytheism becomes, the more clearly does it conceive of the one who creates and dominates the many. The nearest approach to monotheism that exists is ultra-Protestant Christianity, which has lost its angelology, and even this is a ditheism because it worships God the Son as well as God the Father. Concerning God the Holy Ghost, of which it has little understanding, it keeps silence and, for all practical purposes, ignores it. Catholic Christianity has replaced the gods with saints and develops and encourages what is called dulia, the veneration paid to minor and specialized manifestations of the divine. The different saints, by virtue of their personal experiences and consequent presumed sympathies, preside over different aspects of human needs and activities. St. Christopher is the patron saint of all travelers. There are also local saints, the patrons of localities, to whom pilgrimages are made and prayers are said. What is the difference between this concept and that of the polytheistic Hindu, with his scores of deities, specialized and localized? What is the difference in principle between Ganesa, god of moneylenders, and Christopher, patron saint of travelers? The only real difference lies in the fact that the instructed Catholic does not pray to the saint as the dispenser of blessings, but implores the saint to intercede for him with the deity. This is a subtle but important point. The uninstructed Catholic, however, makes his prayers and little offerings direct to the saint, troubled by no such fine distinctions. His attitude is exactly the same as of the uninstructed Hindu. The invocation of a specialized power, believed to be specially appropriate to the occasion, and therefore more efficacious than generalized beneficence, is deep-rooted in human nature. The outpatient at the hospital scornfully rejects advice on hygiene and demands a bottle of physic as strongly flavored and highly colored as possible. It is an ineradicable trait in human nature to want something definite and tangible that it can see and handle. St. Thomas, the doubting disciple, is the patron saint of many more than those who call upon his name, and be it noted that our Lord did not express any marked disapproval of his caution, but bid make him his experiment and proof for himself. It is because of the very nature of our minds that we need this definiteness and tangibility, for our minds are built up by experience of sensory images, and they know no other language. It is only by means of the calisthenics of meditation that the power to conceive abstract ideas is built up, and those less highly developed intellectually never succeed in building it. For them, translation into terms of concrete imagery is essential. The one God is for the initiate. The many must have the many. God must incarnate, must be made man before he can come within range of man's awareness. The relationship of concept is, in many cases, a relationship, in fact, where the most local of the Catholic saints are concerned. A very small amount of archaeological research serves to prove that the local saints are, in a very large number of cases, local pagan deities, or deities that had important local festivals, which have been taken over, festivals and all, by the Roman Catholic Church when she was organizing her field of missionary activity. There was great wisdom in this, for local deities and local festivals were a source of income to the neighborhood, and their abolition would have caused not only local hardship, but resistance and rebellion. The wise thing, and the simple thing, in dealing with ignorant folk was to re-Christian the deity and canonize him and provide him with an appropriate legend. 
Then the old folk carried on the profitable business of the festival come fair, and the young folk were entertained by the legend, and everybody was happy in their simple way, and in one generation the conversion was effected without inflicting hardship on anybody. The Roman Catholic Church is a very wise church and adapts her methods to the nature of the human mind, instead of trying to alter human nature from what it is to what it ought to be as a preliminary to salvation. In the pagan faiths, the same principles prevail. The simple soul likes gods and plenty of them, full-flavored and highly colored, but the instructed and thoughtful man develops the idea of the God behind the gods, the creator and sustainer, whose nature determines the nature of his creation. Right relationship with whom is essential to man's welfare in this world and the next. This is not a God who will be satisfied with burnt offerings, but demands a righteous life. Monotheistic Judaism, upon its orthodox side, bears much resemblance in spirit to Protestant Christianity, which latter, in actual fact, draws its inspiration from the Old Testament far more than from the New. But mystical Judaism, the Judaism of the Kabbalah, knows the ten holy archangels, the spirits before the throne, and innumerable choirs of angels, their servitors. These are the exact analog of the saints and gods of other faiths, so much so that there exist what are called the tables of correspondences, in which saints, gods, and angels are classified together under their respective headings, and no honest student with the facts before him cares to upset that classification, little as it may appeal to a one-way mind, to whom the truth has been delivered once and for all in his own little Bethel with the tin roof. In order to understand a man's point of view, we need to put ourselves in his place and enter into it imaginatively, even if not sympathetically. We owe a great deal of our misconceptions of other people's faiths to the fact that the first translators of their holy books were in many cases Christian missionaries, and these reserved for the expression of their own teaching all words that had a laudatory meaning and reserved for the teachings of their opponents, even when these were identical with their own upon specific points, words that had debased associations. If the words that were translated as gods had been translated as archangels, as they ought to have been, we should have had a much better understanding with some of our spiritual neighbors, though of course we might not have contributed so liberally to missionary societies as we have done had we realized that the spiritual plight of these, our brethren, was by no means desperate. The different great faiths evolved at different epochs of the world's history and represent different stages of spiritual development. Those who have studied esoteric science know that the different levels of consciousness which correspond to the different planes developed at successive epochs of cosmic evolution. If the great faiths be examined from the standpoint of consciousness, that is to say, from the standpoint of psychology rather than theology, it will be found that they correspond to these different phases of development. Each religion builds upon the basis left behind by its predecessor, even when it repudiates it and all its works and looks upon its gods as devils. Each religion tries to give a complete answer to the riddle of the Sphinx, but it will be remembered that the riddle of the Sphinx had four clauses, and it is generally to be found that each new faith comes to answer one or another of these clauses and leaves the rest of the problem untouched. Each faith then specializes and at the same time tends to become one-sided. We shall find that the faith held as the official exoteric religion of his race is the faith that speaks to a man's conscious mind, that his personal religion, if he has any, is the product of his superconscious mind, and that the primitive folk religion of his race rules over his unconscious mind and fills it with its symbols and images. The racial past lives on in the subconscious mind of each of us, as the Zurich School of Psychology recognizes, but it can be evoked to visible appearance in a manner which no orthodox psychologist is acquainted with. It is this evocation of the racial past which is the key to certain forms of ceremonial magic, which have as their aim the evocation of principalities and powers. The different gods and goddesses of a polytheistic faith, or the angels and archangels of a monotheistic one, are neither divine creations nor the arbitrary products of the imagination. They are the creations of the created, fashioned in astral substance after a manner well understood by the esotericist and ensouled by cosmic forces. A cosmic force without an astral form is not a god, and a god form unensouled by cosmic force is not a god either. 
when a cosmic force of a pure type, that is to say, with a single specialized mode of activity, uncontaminated by any alien type of energy to detract from its single pointedness, is embodied in an astral thought form of a suitable type, which gives full scope to its activities, we have what is called an artificial elemental. When the thought form in which the embodiment takes place is made by the composite efforts of the group mind of a race and is ensouled by one of the primary modes of cosmic energy, we have what is called in some faiths a god and in others an archangel. A god, therefore, is an artificial element of a very powerful type, built up over long periods of time by successive generations whose minds were cast in the same mold. It is, therefore, a form of such potency that no evocator can hope to dominate it in the way he would an elemental of his own creating. He must yield himself to its influence and permit it to dominate him if it is to be evoked to visible manifestation. The operator himself is the channel of evocation. It is in his imagination that the image of both God and elemental builds itself up, and it is the corresponding aspect of his own nature which provides the ensouling force. In the case of an artificial elemental, however, the whole of the force is derived subjectively, but in the case of a god, objective, racial, cosmic force passes through the corresponding aspect of the operator's nature to ensoul the form. In the great majority of cases of evocative magic, the form is built up on the astral and can only actually be seen by the clairvoyant, though any sensitive person can feel its influence. It is only when there is a materializing medium as a member of the circle that materialization takes place and the form evoked is visible to the physical eye. A tenuous type of form can be induced to build itself up by the use of certain substances that give off ectoplasm, the principle of which is fresh blood. Excreta can also be used for the same purpose. A considerable bulk of these unpleasant substances is necessary, however, to get a form of any definiteness and their virtue is fugitive, for the ectoplasm has gone off by the time the body heat has departed. Therefore, for all practical purposes, they are of no use to the operator under the ordinary conditions of civilized life. Neither can a very high type of presence be induced to manifest through such media. It is necessary to mention them, however, because the fact that they emanate ectoplasm explains certain phenomena of occult pathology. There is also a field of research here for the scientific student with the necessary laboratory equipment, though for obvious reasons it does not lend itself to drawing room performances or the operations of home circles. It is valuable to note in this connection that constipation, which is the accumulation of a bulk of excreta within the body, is frequently found to be present in obsessional hallucinations, which yield immediately to the exorcism of a purgative, and it is probable that the accumulation of feces forms the physical basis of the obsessing entity. The initiated magician is usually, unless engaged in some special experiment or research, content to evoke to visible appearance on the astral, depending upon his psychic powers for communication with the entity evoked. He does not go to the trouble to evoke to visible appearance on the physical because, if he is an adequate psychic, astral appearance serves his purpose just as well, in fact better, because it is more congenial to the nature of the beings invoked and places less limitation upon their activities. He knows quite well that it is his own temperament which is the channel of evocation and that his own astral body supplies the basis of manifestation. He knows, therefore, that the chief part of his preparation must be self-preparation. Part of the work of the mysteries consists in developing grade by grade the different aspects of the microcosm, which is man, and linking them up by means of symbols planted in consciousness with the corresponding macrocosmic aspects, which are the gods. Once a student has taken a given grade, he should be capable of evoking the beings of all grades corresponding to that particular type of cosmic force, and not only of evoking them, for anyone can do that who has a little knowledge and plenty of imagination, but also of controlling their manifestations when evoked. In order to do this, he needs to have the corresponding force in himself purified, developed, equilibrated, and controlled. His control of the objective manifestation depends entirely on his control of the corresponding subjective factor, or trait in his character. Mars is an easy potency to evoke to visible appearance, but a difficult one to control when evoked, for the control of the Gibura potencies depends entirely upon our control of our own tempers. 
equally with Venus. Our power over whim depends upon our control of our emotions. To operate in the sphere of Luna, we must be very sure of the accuracy of our psychism, which depends upon thought control. One of the most important uses of ceremonial working lies in its power to energize any given aspect of our nature, and so bring about a profound change in character, doing in a brief hour's work what years of painful effort and self-discipline might fail to achieve. A man cannot make himself brave by force of will. He can merely keep the outward manifestations of fear under control, though they may be tearing him to pieces inwardly. But by means of an operation of Mars, he may fundamentally change his nature. It is for this reason that ceremonial and especially talismanic magic is the essential complement of astrology. For astrology is the diagnosis of the trouble, but magic is the treatment of it by means of which the warring forces in our natures are equilibrated. These things, however, can only be done when there is adequate knowledge in order that the real needs of a nature may be discerned. It is little use to do an operation of Mars for a person whose fears are not due to lack of courage out to a too lively imagination. An operation of Luna is indicated in such a case. An operation of Mars, misguidedly undertaken, will merely make him excessively quarrelsome. The karmic record also must be taken into consideration when doing operative magic of a concentrated kind, for some unbalanced manifestations of character may be of the nature of reactions, or what the psychologist calls overcompensations. For instance, the timidity for which an operation of Mars is desired may be due to lack of wisdom in the past, which produced disastrous karmic consequences, which are even now being worked out. The concentration of a martial force is not going to help such a condition as that, but will tend to produce fresh problems for it to solve. Moreover, operations should never come singly, but always in the equilibrating pairs of opposites, and it is usually sound policy to perform the operation of the opposite pillar previous to the performance of the operation whose effect is specifically desired. For instance, if the energizing effects of Mars, Geburah, Severity, are desired, it would be highly desirable to perform a few days previously an operation of Jupiter, Chesed, Mercy, which balances Mars in the opposite column of the Tree of Life when the symbols are set up according to the system of the Kabbalists. If this is done, all the good of Mars will be obtained without any of the evil of its unbalanced influence. Although the highly concentrated form of a force should only be applied by an expert to one who has undergone the necessary preparation leading up thereto, there can be little doubt that life could be made much richer and our temperaments far more vital and equilibrated were we to observe the times and seasons in a way that all primitive faiths that are in close touch with nature observe them. The Catholic aspect of the Christian faith, which is its most occult aspect, scrupulously observes the seasons of the Christian year, which is really a sun worship year. But the Protestant aspect has no realization whatsoever of what it is doing and drags itself through the 52 Sundays with one set of altar frontals and a plain white surplus. The four elements, the seven planets, and the twelve signs of the zodiac are prime factors of the cosmos. Each of these have their tides and seasons of ascendancy, and each have their appropriate symbols and rites developed in one or another of the great pagan systems of nature worship. Nature worship, be it noted, is not idolatry, but the adoration of God made manifest in nature, and is an exceedingly important aspect of both our faith and our psychology, though one but little understood in the Christian system and Western countries. The different gods and archangels of the different systems, Egyptian, Greek, Chaldean, Norse, which are native to our culture, are the racial thought forms built up to act as vehicles of these primary cosmic forces. Being the primitive faith of our racial culture, their symbols lie deep hidden in the subconscious mind in each of us, utterly ineradicable and capable of evocation to conscious activity by the use of the appropriate means. All the pagan pantheons contain these same factors because they all have to minister to the needs of a human nature that does not vary very much as to its ingredients from race to race and age to age, but merely in the proportion in which these are on the average compounded. The North has more head and the South more heart, the East more intuition and the West more will, but neither head nor heart are entirely absent from any race on the Earth's surface. 
Systems, consequently, are built up and specialized according to the temperament of the people they minister to. Consequently, when we want to perform a rite of any given type, we find it convenient to choose a method which is most closely fitted to the needs of the moment and our own temperamental basis. The Chaldean magic of the Kabbalah appears to those who are imbued with a strict monotheism and regard all objects of adoration with unfamiliar names as devils. Egyptian magic appeals to those who are metaphysically minded and Greek mystery methods to the artistic because the Greek invocations depend upon music and movement for their efficacy. These three systems form the primary basis of our Western tradition. They also represent its most highly developed aspects, but for all practical purposes they present many difficulties in the employment, and people who try them usually get only partial effects unless they are very advanced workers or have a special natural aptitude and affinity for the particular tradition according to which they are operating. The reason for this is not far to seek. None of these methods have been naturalized in our islands and we cannot therefore find a holy place at which to pick up the contacts in a prepared atmosphere where the veil is thin and the foot of Jacob's ladder rests upon the earth. Moreover, the racial subconsciousness, although it contains all the elements represented by the exotic gods and goddesses, for we are not made of special and peculiar clay different from the rest of mankind, does not contain the symbols that evoke them in the form in which they have been built up in the racial subconsciousness of the races that were habituated to their daily use as objects of adoration. It is only because these races are dead and gone and their cultures have passed away that we can use their symbols at all. For if the system were a living system, it would automatically exclude us from its penetralia unless right of entry had been conferred upon us. It is for this reason that we can never operate a living system of magic effectually unless its degrees have been conferred upon us. The voodoo and the tantric systems are closed systems to the European, but the Egyptian and the Chaldean are open systems, which anyone may operate who can, because their priests are dead and their temples stand open to the sun and wind, and there is no one to guard their mysteries from profanation, save the intrinsic powers of those mysteries themselves. These, however, are a quite effectual guard for all practical purposes, for though they cannot prevent the blasphemer from having his first bite, as it were, he seldom has a second, for the powers he has evoked and profaned destroy him. But why should we esteem an outraged deity a devil? Because a misused force reacts on the user, it is not necessarily a force of evil. Has no one ever taken a poisonous overdose of a drug, or received a shock when he touched the wrong switch, or miscalculated the temperature of an object and burnt his fingers? If we banished from human use as dangerous every object or substance that had ever under any circumstances proved noxious, we should exist in a vacuum. These powers, however, duly approached with reverence and understanding, and after the purification demanded for their worship, can still exert their ancient influence over the worshiper, blessing and illuminating him according to their nature and his capacity for response. These great potencies, thus approached, have infinite possibilities for good to exercise upon human consciousness and social life, and especially is this case in our modern urban civilization, where the nature contacts have been lost and forgotten, and in consequence, the subconscious minds of men and women are as foul as uncleansed stables. We need the light and air of conscious attention to be directed to our subconscious fastnesses and the clean broom of spiritual sanctification to make a clean sweep of their accumulated rubbish and refuse. There is nothing in human nature which is intrinsically unclean, St. Augustine notwithstanding, but there is a very great amount which will go septic and putrefy if we thrust it below the level of consciousness and sit upon the lid. It is a false concept of human nature which has developed so much that is worst in human nature. When we deny the natural side of our natures, we are like a woman who will not clean a stopped sink because it is too dirty to touch. It is only dirty on account of the way she has kept it. It may be unpleasant to handle when first it is taken in hand and cleared up, but once clean, it need never be allowed to get into that condition again, but it will certainly be a source of poison to the whole household until it is taken in hand. The pagans were right when they deified and sanctified all aspects of nature and of human nature. The Romans even adored Cloaca, the goddess of sewers and scavengers, and they were far cleaner and more sanitary in their habits than the generations who succeeded them, 
and whose saints refrained from washing out of love for God. We need to bring back reverence for natural things and respect for the body and its functions and adore God made manifest in nature, even in the form of the goddess Cloaca, if we are able to have any real health of mind, body, or estate, and return as prodigals to the bosom of our great mother, where alone is to be found healing for the diseases that arise from too much civilization and too little sun and air.